Welcome to this installment of the Geriatric Lecture Series. My name is Kevin Schleich. I am a clinical pharmacist in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Iowa. Today I'll be talking about balancing the risks and benefits of deprescribing high-risk medications in our geriatric patients. Part of my job responsibilities in the Family Medicine Clinic at the University of Iowa include being an active member in our geriatric assessment clinic. And as the pharmacist in that clinic, I take it as my responsibility to continuously look at patients' medication lists and make sure that their current drug regimen actually fits with their ongoing needs. And oftentimes we find that deprescribing is what's in the best interest of the patient from both a safety perspective, but also from an efficacy perspective as well. I do not have any conflicts of interest. And over the course of the next hour, we're going to talk about polypharmacy and how it affects the issue of deprescribing in our older patients. Now, I know if you've been following along, John Swaggle ad addressed the issue of polypharmacy in great detail and talked about the statistics with polypharmacy, tools that we can use to evaluate polypharmacy, and things that we can be cognizant of to help us avoid polypharmacy in the future. Today, I'll actually look at a number of the patients that we've encountered in our, encountered in our geriatric assessment clinic and utilize them as some case-based learning to help highlight the pros and cons that we think through when we're considering deprescribing in these patients. And by the end of the talk, I hope that you're able to identify appropriate patients in your clinic that may be candidates for deprescribing. So here is some of this background information. And this is not too far away right now. By 2030, it's predicted that all baby boomers are gonna be over 65 years of age, which means that one in five of the US population will be of retirement age. And just five years after that, for the first time in U.S. history, we'll actually have more people who are of geriatric age, and that's defined as, as age 65 and older, than we will people younger than 18. So if you look at this schematic here, in 1960, we had really a, a pretty good pyramid look of the most amount of people being between 0 and 10 to 14 years of age. And then it just pyramided up to the top with actually very few people who exceeded 85 years of age. But by 2060, it's predicted that this pyramid form is actually going to move to a pillar. Uh, and we're going to have essentially about the same number of people throughout the entire span of life. So this is another illustration of why this topic is so important. So we're looking at different amounts of prescriptions given to different age groups of people here. Uh, one thing to note is that 90% of people who are 65 and older take at least one medication. So that's considered our geriatric population. If you look all the way to the right, we're looking at more than five medications. And that number actually might be significant because as we talk about on the next slide, there's a number of different definitions of polypharmacy, but five prescriptions tends to be a number that a lot of people focus on. And when we get to that number, you can see that over 60, over 40%, excuse me, of patients 65 and older actually take five or more medications. The reason that polypharmacy is important is that all of the implications of it are, are essentially bad. So we see decreased quality of life, increased cost burden, increased mortality, and then a greater prevalence of adverse drug events, frailty, falls, as we all know, we get worse adherence to medications the more medications that we get. And as I briefly mentioned on our last slide, we don't have a great definition of polypharmacy, but a lot of, a lot of literature will state five or more medications. But as John mentioned, it's actually not necessarily the number of medications that's important, but the use of just unnecessary medications. And that could be a single unnecessary medication, it could be multiple unnecessary medications, but the, the presence of an unnecessary medication would indicate some degree of polypharmacy. Now, when we're talking about things that put patients at risk of polypharmacy, we need to think about both patient risk factors and system risk factors. So there's a number of patient risk factors that we think about, and a lot of these things are unfortunately things that we cannot control. So as we get older, our risk of polypharmacy increases. The presence of cognitive impairment and other mental health conditions puts us at a greater risk of developing polypharmacy. Frailty is very closely linked to polypharmacy. And then these are a couple of the things that we actually can control. So a lack of a primary care provider has been well known to be correlated very well with polypharmacy. So patients who just see multiple specialists and don't have someone who they identify as their primary care provider tend to be at greater risk of developing polypharmacy.
And obviously people that have more chronic conditions are going to be on more medications, but more kind of complicated conditions generally alludes to the fact that people are seeing multiple subspecialists. And so you kind of have that old adage of too many cooks in the kitchen. From a system-based standpoint, we always think of transition of care of being a very important time period in the patient's life. And this is not just your traditional hospital to home transition of care. This is anywhere that a patient's changing hands. So this could be hospital to a skilled facility. This could be a skilled facility to home. Basically anywhere that a patient is changing their living arrangement introduces a chance for polypharmacy and worsened outcomes. Now one thing that's kind of interesting is we're still relatively new to the fact of these disease specific quality measures. And I'll pick on heart failure because I think at least most people, even if you're not a, a cardiovascular specialist, most people are familiar with the disease specific quality metrics for heart failure where we need to have patients on an aspirin and a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor and all these things that you go through a checklist and make sure patients are on to, making sure, to make sure that we're meeting these quality metrics. However, as we get older, these metrics might not be as relevant and actually can pa put patients at greater risk of developing adverse effects. However, if you're just strictly looking at meeting those metrics, you may feel obligated to keep patients on medications even when it's not necessarily safe to do so anymore. In addition, automated refills are very convenient for patients in terms of having, being able to avoid calling in the uh, new prescription refills to the pharmacy and doing so on a monthly basis or every three months. However, for those of us who are familiar with the process of discontinuing a prescription during clinic, we know that all of our systems don't talk to each other. So for example, at UIHC, we have the Epic Medical Record, which does not talk with local pharmacies. So in order to 100% guarantee that you actually discontinue a medication, I actually take it upon myself to call the pharmacy and tell them that we're stopping something. Because in a system of automatic refills, if a patient, for example, is discontinued on enalapril in clinic, but the pharmacy is not notified of it, they can continue to get the refills of the enalapril foreseeably until that, that refill expires. So it could be up to a year where a patient continues getting medications when it's not the intention of the provider. So where do we start? And this picture demonstrates that essentially every organ system can be implicated in polypharmacy. So fortunately, we have a couple different pharmacists who will be specializing in some of these specific organ systems. Cordy Kennelty will be talking about opioids and anxiolytics. We have a specific lecture towards the end of the series that'll be talking about antipsychotics. So I'll touch on those just very briefly because we seem to encounter these quite frequently, but I won't talk about them at length today. So I do want to start with what seems like a very low piece of hanging fruit, and that is talking about urinary incontinence. This is something that we encounter quite frequently in the geriatrics assessment clinic, and I want to utilize a case to demonstrate how we can consider discontinuing a medication for a patient who has incontinence. So this is an 84-year-old lady who actually has a pretty insignificant past medical history. She only has hypertension, that incontinence that we just talked about, she meets the frailty criteria, and then she has some macular degeneration as well. Now, if you look at her med list, she actually would not meet the criteria for polypharmacy if, you, if you're just looking at number of prescriptions, since she only has technically two prescriptions and an over-the-counter medication. But this is where number can be a little bit irrelevant. We should actually be focusing on the type of medications that are on the med list and potentially inappropriate ones at that. So she's taking amlodipine for her hypertension. She takes oxybutynin for the incontinence and then just a multivitamin to help with her visual acuity. Now, a couple things here that can be easy to overlook but are very relevant in this case are number one, that she lives alone at home, and number two, she goes to the bathroom about one time per night, which is a significant improvement from where she was prior to starting oxybutynin when she was getting up four to five times per night. So oxybutynin is kind of the poster child for the Beers criteria list. It's been on the Beers criteria basically since it's been around, uh, and the reason it's on the list and so high on the list is because it's so strongly anticholinergic. And the anticholinergic properties of the drug lead to patients having dizziness, falls, and cognitive impairment. So what I want to do for each of these cases is I want to show uh, a diagram basically of what we're thinking through in clinic when we're thinking through the process of what could be beneficial and what could be detrimental in stopping a medication for these patients. Now you may think with oxybutynin there's going to be only pros and very, very few cons, but as we kind of talk through some of these things, you'll see that maybe none of these decisions are quite as straightforward as they would seem. So from a positive standpoint, obviously we're stopping oxybutynin. So I just mentioned this is 
consistently at the top of the beers criteria list. So this is something that just looks good. Your peers will be happy with you, your friends will be happy with you, you're, you're stopping oxybutynin. Um, because of its anticholinergic properties that I just mentioned, you're likely going to be preventing those things that I just talked about. So the dizziness, the falls, the altered cognition. You'll notice with each of these things, when we talk about deprescribing, one of the major benefits that you get is you're reducing pill burden. So as we talked about at the very beginning, if you can reduce pill burden, you can probably improve in, uh, uh, adherence and you can probably improve patient quality of life. Again, sticking with the theme of you're stopping a beer's criteria medication, it just, it looks good. From a con standpoint though, we've already mentioned that this lady used to be getting up in the middle of the night four to five times per day, uh, per night, and going to the bathroom. So she's certainly probably gonna have increased urinary symptoms when you stop this. With that, specifically for her case, you're probably gonna see increased nighttime awakenings, which actually, because of her macular degeneration and her decreased visual acuity, could put her at a greater risk for falls. You can foresee the circumstance where she gets up a number of times in the middle of the night, it's dark, she doesn't bother turning on a light, and she trips over a rug or trips over the cat or something like that. So even though you're taking away a medication that's very well known to contribute to falls, you actually could be indirectly increasing her risk of falls by increasing her urination frequency. So for each of these cases, we'll talk about uh, a number of different options that are potentially available in terms of deprescribing. So these are all things that we talked about, all potential options that we talked about, and I will tell you that none of these are necessarily right or wrong. I'll end up showing you what we ultimately chose, but I want you all to take a, uh, a second and think about what you would do in your clinic if you saw this patient. So for this particular situation, we, we considered discontinuing oxybutynin, we consider just decreasing the dose to five milligrams a day, thereby limiting her exposure to that and hopefully decreasing the potential for adverse effects. We considered replacing oxybutynin with mirabigron, and then we decided we would want to uh, provide strategies to reduce evening urination issues. So again, just take a second to think about what you would be doing if you were seeing this patient. And basically what we did is we decided that because of the risk of if we just stopped everything, we felt pretty certain that she would go back to going to the bathroom four to five times per night. And that was not a risk we were willing to take with her macular degeneration and the risk of potential evening falls. So we wanted to give her something that replaced the oxybutynin. And we went with Mirabigron because that's significantly less anticholinergic. Uh, and therefore, you, you decrease the risk of having all those side effects that go with the oxybutynin. And then unfortunately, she had never actually been counseled on some of the non-pharmacologic things she could do to reduce nocturia. So she was very well uh, in shape. She, she worked out essentially every day down in her facilities pool. And as a result, she was very cognizant on making sure that she stayed well hydrated. So she would drink a good amount of water throughout the entire day. Never had been told that she should probably limit her fluid intake to some degree after three or four at night. Uh, and that alone actually made a significant difference for her. So between those two things, we felt better about the direction we were going uh, for her overall medication profile. And although we didn't actually get rid of a medication, so we didn't reduce her pill burden, we felt a lot safer about the direction that we were going. So again, that was a pretty easy one. I think everyone can agree that stopping oxybutynin is pretty much a no-brainer whenever you can, but we're gonna climb up the difficulty ladder here. So for this specific case, we have a 91-year-old gentleman who has sick sinus syndrome and had a pacemaker placed in August of 2017. He has a history of atrial tachycardia, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the disease state formerly known as diastolic heart failure. He has hypertension, type 2 diabetes. It is diet controlled, so you'll notice that he is not currently taking any medications for his diabetes. He has stage 3 CKD and hypothyroidism. So from a medication standpoint, Again, if you're looking at just sheer numbers, so this gentleman does exceed the five prescriptions. So if you're going by that definition, then yes, maybe he does have polypharmacy. But again, it's still not one of those outrageous med lists that you see every now and then. Specifically, one of the cases that John Swigel presented earlier in the, in the course, I think the patient had about 24 or 25 medications, which as I think we all know is not unheard of. So this patient, again, if we think about some of our disease-specific quality metrics, a lot of these medications are on board because of the patient's heart failure. Even though heart failure with preserved ejection fraction does not have nearly the same um, evidence-based guidance as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we still tend to do very similar things.
So this patient's on aspirin, atorvastatin, uh, on lisinopril and metoprolol, all for his heart failure. Also on amlodipine to help with his hypertension. And the digoxin stuck out to, the, to us. This was something that we were not really sure why this patient was taking. Uh, he has an atrial tachycardia, but not atrial fibrillation. He has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, again, not reduced ejection fraction. And we're, when we're looking at him a little bit more in-depthly, a couple things stick out. So as I mentioned, he has stage 3 CKD, which is evidenced by his creatinine clearance being 35 mils per minute, and then his digoxin level. And this can be tricky. So his digoxin level is certainly not super therapeutic, but that's where things can get a little bit tricky. So I put dreaded digoxin because this is always one of those medications that we just have no idea what to do with from a primary care standpoint. The Beers criteria is very clear that digoxin should not be used first line for essentially any indication, including atrial fibrillation or heart failure. If it is used for any of those things, essentially as a last line medication, in elderly patients, you should never use more than the 0.125 milligrams per day. So at least in this situation, this gentleman was receiving an appropriate dose. The STOP criteria, which is another thing that I know John introduced at the beginning of the series, talks about not having patients on greater than that 1.25 milligrams per day if they have compromised renal function, and that would be defined as a creatinine clearance of less than 50. The problem with digoxin toxicity, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this, is that this can occur at therapeutic concentrations. So even though this gentleman had a very normal digoxin level, that does not necessarily mean he is safe from having digoxin toxicity. So you can essentially think that digoxin monitoring doesn't do you any good in an elderly patient, which is not 100% true. You still should check it if a patient is on digoxin because you do want to make sure that it's not supra therapeutic, but you cannot absolutely rule out digoxin toxicity just based on either a therapeutic or a subtherapeutic digoxin level. The other tricky thing with this is the symptoms generally with digoxin toxicity are really, really nonspecific. So very infrequently do you have a patient present with some of these very dead giveaway uh, symptoms of digoxin toxicity. Instead, it tends to be things like the drowsiness and the headache, anorexia, weight loss, things that could just be related to about everything. I will say our emergency department at the University of Iowa is very, very good at identifying this in elderly patients who are on digoxin. We've seen a number of patients who have come into our ER who have just kind of this this nonspecific constellation of symptoms where they just seem to have failure to thrive, which I know people hate to use, um, but they tend to stop digoxin because they think that could be a contributing factor. And to their credit, there's been a number of times that it actually has been that contributing factor. So the other reason that digoxin can be so difficult is that the factors that can lead to digoxin toxicity are often associated with advanced age. So we know with advanced age, we see worsening renal function and hepatic metabolism. So our kidneys and our liver does not work as well as it used to. There's a number of chronic disease states that are not unique to elderly patients, but we seem to see more of in our elderly population. So things like heart failure, both hyper and hypothyroidism, and then electrolyte disturbances. So low levels of potassium, low levels of magnesium, those can all lead to digoxin toxicity. And then there's a number of drug-drug interactions with digoxin, very dirty drug. Uh, and again, these drugs are certainly not specific to our geriatric population, but we think of things like statins, SSRIs. Unfortunately, EDSEDs are the class of meds that you really have no control over because patients can get these over the counter. So you don't truly know if patients are taking these or not. So now we're thinking again about what are the pros and the cons of stopping digoxin in this patient. So again, anytime we're able to stop a medication, we're obviously decreasing the pill burden for that patient, which is a benefit. Again, if the patient's not on digoxin, it makes it pretty impossible for them to have digoxin toxicity. So we'd be able to totally eliminate that from our list of concerns. Regardless of what the indication is, so either heart failure or arrhythmia, digoxin's actually never been shown to have any kind of mortality benefit. Additionally, for this particular patient, we still couldn't even identify a true indication for him. He did have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and he had uh, atrial tachycardia, but he did not have atrial fibrillation. So there really wasn't a reason for him to be on digoxin as far as we could see. In terms of the cons, this is one of those drugs that you're always sort of concerned about a return of either a possibly fatal arrhythmia or a, even a non-fatal arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation that always goes through the back of your mind as, as to maybe we shouldn't stop this quite yet. 
Additionally, if the patient was taking it for heart failure, particularly for the reduced ejection fraction heart failure, it has been shown that digoxin can decrease those rates of hospitalizations. Therefore, if he was doing that and we stopped the digoxin, potentially you could see that we'd put him at a greater risk of being hospitalized more frequently. And then always the issue of you feel like you might be stepping on specialist toes. So if cardiology was the one that prescribed this, it always feels like maybe it's not the right move to discontinue a medication that was not started by primary care or whatnot. So there's always that concern of, of kind of stepping on toes. So for this particular patient, we considered the following things. So just stopping the digoxin and praying that nothing bad happened. We considered continuing the digoxin but consulting cardiology just so they could take a renewed look at why exactly is this patient on digoxin. Talked about stopping digoxin and doing a 30-day event monitor just to see if any kind of arrhythmia manifested and then just continuing digoxin. Again, being kind of afraid of the return of an arrhythmia, stepping on toes, we considered all of those things. So again, consider what you would do and this is what we ended up doing. So we continued digoxin but we did want cardiology's input specifically wording the consultation as saying, would this patient be appropriate to discontinue digoxin? Ultimately, cardiology decided that there truly was no indication for them. Uh, they did decide that they wanted to taper off the digoxin, so they, they suggested 125 micrograms every other day, basically until the patient was seen again by cardiology in six months, and then they discontinued it at that time. So again, there was more to it than just seeing a drug on the Beers criteria list and saying this needs to go. There were a lot of things in consideration in terms of making sure that we didn't put the patient at risk of some sort of adverse effect by stopping the drug. So the next thing we'll talk about is the ongoing conundrum of anticoagulation in elderly patients. This always kind of puts us between the proverbial rock and hard place. We're always trying to balance the risk of being on anticoagulation versus the benefit of avoiding the possible harm that could happen from not being anticoagulated. So here we have a 90-year-old female who has a past medical history significant for AFib, hypertension, hypothyroidism, osteopenia, and she's been hospitalized a number of times in really the past year and a half. And I'll detail those hospitalizations and emergency room visits. Uh, I'll dedicate a slide specifically to that just so we can see what's going on. So currently she's taking the reduced dose of apixaban for her atrial fibrillation, which is appropriate. She's greater than 80 years of age and her weight is below 60 kilograms. She's also taking atorvastatin, benazapril, vitamin D, levothyroxine, and metoprolol. So again, in terms of sheer numbers of medications, this lady's medication list is not that impressive. But when you're talking about one of the highest risk medications in any age group, when you're talking about anticoagulants, this is something that always needs to be evaluated in terms of whether or not it is appropriate. So this is this lady's anticoagulation history. I actually met her in 2011. She came into clinic just for a general follow-up and as kind of a door handle complaint, she said, I guess I am a little bit more tired and a little bit more short of breath recently. So our doctor got an EKG on her and sure enough, she was in AFib. At that time, so this was in, actually I might've said 2011, this was in 2015 that we saw her. Um, the DOAC, so the direct oral acting anticoagulants were still relatively new, not new because Pradaxa came out in 2011, but still relatively new that we felt like warfarin was still the anticoagulant of choice for this lady, in part due to its reversibility. At the time, her CHADS2 VASC score was four and her HADS blood score was two. For those of you who are not familiar with those ranking systems, I have dedicated a slide to that as well and we'll walk through what that means. But anticoagulation is actually unique in the sense that we, we actually have validated tools that allow us to actually figure out the risk of anticoagulating patients by determining what their predicted bleed risk is versus their risk of having a thrombotic event and figuring out what that risk is and comparing those two things. So after starting warfarin, she complained of this kind of mix of persistent yet intermittent diarrhea that she attributed to the warfarin and constantly wanted to stop the warfarin. So over the next two years, every time we saw her, she said she wanted to stop the warfarin because she thought it was contributing to diarrhea. Uh, as you know, that's not a common complaint with warfarin. So we continued to reinforce the importance of her being anticoagulated until finally in July of 2017, we actually again discussed using a DOAC with her. 
and we chose Apixaban. And at that time, again, her Chad's Vask score and her Hasblood score remained the exact same. So as I mentioned, this is a history of her both emergency room visits and her hospitalizations over really the past about year and a half. So in December of 2017, she was seen for what the emergency room called a mechanical fall. However, asking her a little bit more about it and reading through the notes a little bit, she was actually backing up and kind of got dizzy and lost her whereabouts and fell over. Uh, didn't trip over anything, so the classification of a mecha mechanical fall could be a little bit questionable. She was seen again later that month for rectal bleeding and was found to have colitis and internal hemorrhoids, which were managed just via the ER. In July of 2018, so she went about seven months without being seen uh, anywhere acutely, she was hospitalized for three days for severe diarrhea and was found to have Clostridium difficile. Again, she was hospitalized later that year in November for another five days for more severe diarrhea and was found to have ischemic colitis. Uh, later on, just about a month later, she was hospitalized for a full week for a UTI and was delirious. And then finally in March of 2019, she had a syncopal episode. Uh, it ended up being a vasovagal event where she was on the toilet and had a syncopal episode. But nonetheless, she fell, bumped her head. Uh, and so she's had a lot of these issues that have required acute treatment uh, over the past year and a half. And this is abnormal for her. This is, she's a lady who we would usually be able to get into clinic every three to six months, and she would have no visits in the interim period between then, between those visits. So this is something that's abnormal for her. So as promised, we'll jump back just for those who are not familiar with the CHADS2 VASC and the Hasblood score. These are scoring systems and they're mnemonics, so it makes it a little bit easier to remember. So the CHADS2 VASC is a validated tool for the risk of thromboembolism in patients with atrial fibrillation. And you get points based on a specific set of characteristics, uh, ranging from disease states to age to gender. And then the Hasblood score is basically the same thing on the other side of things when you're considering bleed risk. So again, a mnemonic that makes it pretty easy to remember. If a patient has any of these things, you get the designated number of points. And then based on those points, we can look at estimating what a patient's either percent year risk or patient year risk is for developing either a thromboembolic event, so a stroke with the CHADS2 VASC score, or a bleeding event with the Hasblood score. So for this particular patient, again, if we look back to 2015 when we initiated anticoagulation, her Hasblood score was 2 and her CHADS2 VASC score was 4. So that pretty clearly shows that her thromboembolic risk was greater than her bleed risk. However, if you fast forward to March of 2019, when she had been seen in the hospital a bunch, she's now actually had a bleeding event. Her has blood score is three, and her CHADS2 VAST score remains four. So now the scales have tipped a little bit that now her bleed risk is slightly higher than what her embolic risk used to be. So you may be thinking that, well, if we're just going by pure numbers, this is a no-brainer and this lady needs to be stopped on anticoagulation. So if we look at the pros and cons for this specific, specific patient in this specific situation, again, by stopping a medication, we're decreasing her pill burden. With Apixaban in particular, we are decreasing the cost. These DOEX are still very expensive, especially for patients with Medicare. Uh, and have a Part D plan, these generally tend to be a percentage cost of, of what the medication actually is. So these can be very expensive. That expense can be offset by not needing to monitor the drug like you do have to with warfarin. We would obviously be decreasing her bleed risk. If she's not on an, an anticoagulant, her bleed risk would not be zero, but it would certainly be way less than what it is on the anticoagulant. From a negative standpoint, we would obviously be increasing the risk of embolic stroke. That's the reason that we're anticoagulating her in the first place. So if we stop anticoagulation, she's obviously still in atrial fibrillation, we would be increasing her risk of having a stroke. Strokes can lead to disability, worsening quality of life, everything that goes with that. Again, as I already mentioned, monitoring is not an issue with apixaban, but this oftentimes goes on the pro side of discontinuing warfarin, where a patient does not need to get those routine blood checks. And then the patient did not perceive that she was having diarrhea on a Pixaban. So even though she'd been hospitalized for diarrhea um, for a couple days, she did not uh, have the, the idea that the Pixaban was leading to diarrhea. So when you're looking at these pros and cons, again, it looks like that we probably have more advantages to stopping the anticoagulation for her than to keep it going.
but it was not that simple for her. So we had the options of just discontinuing the apixaban. We thought about discontinuing the apixaban and replacing it with aspirin. We thought about just continuing the apixaban at the dose that she's currently taking, which is already that reduced dose based on both her age and her body weight. And then we thought about decreasing the apixaban to just two and a half milligrams per day. So again, I want you to think what you did or what you would do. And ultimately what we ended up doing might surprise you. So we ended up keeping this patient on her current dose of apixaban. And we presented it to the patient as such that we were more concerned now that she has been having increased hospitalizations, she's been having some issues with bleeding and some issues with falling. So we thought that her fall was not necessarily mechanical. And we told her that. We were concerned about her balance. We were concerned about her syncopal event. And we told her that we would probably prefer to discontinue anticoagulation at this time. She responded by saying she actually had two friends that she knew very well within the past year who had a thromboembolic stroke. Uh, one of them was debilitated to the degree that she ended up moving from um, assisted living to full-time nursing home care and was no longer really verbal by any means. Uh, and then the other one actually ended up passing away from her embolic stroke after a couple weeks. So it was fresh on her mind that she wanted to do everything possible to avoid a thromboembolic stroke, uh, even if it means that her bleed risk is slightly higher than what it was previously. So with our discussion amongst ourselves and with shared decision-making with the patient, we ended up deciding that we would continue her anticoagulation for the time being. Much like a number of these cases and, and medication discussions, we left it up in the air with her that we were always going to be reevaluating the risks and the benefits of the anticoagulation though. And that's, that's a conversation that needs to be had with all of these shared decision-making issues is that we need to let the patients know that this is always a continuing reevaluation. And just because she's on anticoagulation right now doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be appropriate in three months or six months or a year. So now we'll introduce the pancreas. So we'll talk about TR, who's an 82-year-old female who has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, stage 4 CKD, neuropathic pain, and mild cognitive impairment. So again, not a ton of medications, but the thing that always probably makes you raise a little bit of a red flag in an elderly patient is insulin. So you see insulin on the list, and you consider that maybe that could be potentially unsafe. If we look at her labs and some of her relevant information over there, we do see that her A1C is 8.5%. So we'll talk a little bit as to whether or not that's actually at goal or not. So again, this is a patient that I follow. Uh, I think the roller coaster picture exemplifies her blood sugar control perfectly. So she's a great example of why we should not just look at someone's glucometer and look at the 14 day or 30 day average. So for her, this 14 day average says 130 milligrams per deciliter, which is perfect. Especially for an 82 year old lady, you'd say that's absolutely perfect. A1C of 8.5 may be okay. Uh, but if you look at how she gets to the, the 130 average, you see an enormous range. So you see a lot of highs, and probably equally as importantly, if not more importantly, you see a decent amount of lows, with the lowest being 61. And to me, that was frightening. So I decided that this probably wasn't the safest regimen for this patient to be on. So the American Diabetes Association does say that avoiding hypoglycemia should be of primary concern when treating elderly patients with diabetes. Number one, uh, it should be assessed and managed by adjusting their glycemic targets and their pharmacologic interventions. And number two, it should probably be one of our primary concerns, even more so than avoiding long-term hyperglycemia. In terms of treatment goals, I mentioned that maybe an A1C of 8.5 was appropriate and maybe it wasn't for this patient. The American Diabetes Association says that even in the healthiest of healthy elderly patients, we're probably not forced to, to get the A1C to less than 7% like what we see for our younger population. So even for those who have fewer coexisting chronic conditions, those who are intact cognitively, functionally are very well fit, uh, even having an A1C goal of less than 7.5% is probably appropriate. When you start getting sicker patients who are more cognitively impaired, have more functional impairments, you can even have less stringent goals than that. So the ADA even recommends going between less than 8 and 8.5%. I'd also like to introduce the Dr. Butler rule. So Dr. Butler is one of the geriatricians that I work with at the university. Uh, he says that if your age is older than 70, if you just take your age and divide it by 10, that's your A1C goal. So for this patient, she's 82. We could probably make an argument that her A1C goal could be 8.2%. Uh, 
I challenge you to actually kind of look at this with your patients and think about their age and what their A1C goal is and see if it fits. I think more often than not, it ends up being a relatively appropriate goal. So again, we mentioned the importance of avoiding hypoglycemia. Uh, and again, that should probably be one of our primary concerns. But I'll also talk in the next slide about the importance of, of preventing hyperglycemia as well. So hypoglycemia is of paramount importance to avoid because patients in, in the elder years tend to have more neurologic symptoms associated with hypoglycemia compared to adrenergic effects. So in our younger patients, when they complain of hypoglycemic effects, events, it generally seems like they have the same type of adrenergic uh, effects. So sweating, shaking, those tend to be some of the first things that they complain about. In the elderly population, we see a lot more of these neurologic issues. So just nondescript things like dizziness, weakness, confusion, things that may or may not jump off the page as you as, as being jump off the page at you as being potentially due to hypoglycemia. Additionally, frequent hypoglycemia can increase cardiovascular events in older adults, and more hypoglycemic events increases the risk of developing dementia. Obviously, if you're having more of these neurologic symptoms, so dizziness and weakness, you increase the risk of falls and fractures as well. However, we don't want to just avoid hypoglycemia by stopping all diabetes medications because we also want to avoid the complications that come with hyperglycemia. So we certainly want to decrease polyuria because if patients are getting up and going to the bathroom all the time, again, we increase the risk of falls, we increase the risk of electrolyte disturbances, and then we certainly see more urinary tract infections and skin breakdown if patients are sitting in urine all day. Visual effects, so obviously blurry vision is a complication of hyperglycemia. Blurry vision can lead to falls. And then persistent hyperglycemia has certainly been known to worsen fatigue. So what are some of the pros and cons of, and I've left this kind of open, we can consider stopping either glipizide or the insulin. So again, decreased pill and potentially injection burden. So this is a huge one. This is always something that if you can keep a patient from injecting, that's, that's a, a huge win, and most patients are very much in favor of that. We would obviously be decreasing her hypoglycemic episodes, which is significant for her since even in just the past couple weeks prior to me seeing her, she had some readings in the 60s, which is way too low for a patient who's in their 80s. Decreased hypoglycemic events, like I mentioned, will lead to less falls, less confusion, things of that nature. From a con standpoint, we're always thinking about increased risk of hyperglycemia. So like I just mentioned, uh, polyuria, polydipsia, things of that nature, we're certainly going to get a worsening of the A1C, which again, if we mentioned that her A1C was at 8.5, she might not quite be at goal yet anyway. With the worsening A1C, you're obviously going to see worsening fasting blood sugars. And then as I mentioned, those complications of hyperglycemia, so polyuria, polydipsia. There's potential vascular concerns as well. Uh, again, this is not quite as important as we see with our younger patients, but there's still concerns of poorly controlled diabetes leading to vascular complications in elderly patients as well. So a number of things that we thought about, we could stop the insulin, we could stop the glipizide, we could decrease the glipizide dose, we could decrease the insulin dose, or we could just continue everything unchanged. So for this particular patient, I decided that it was best to stop the glipizide. And the reason for this is, is a couple fold. So just by virtue of how the sulfonylureas work, they ask the pancreas to secrete more insulin. So what we know now, and we don't know when this actually happens, but based on their mechanism, the sulfonylureas probably have some sort of shelf life. So you can only ask the pancreas to produce so much insulin for so long before you essentially wear it out. Uh, this lady has had diabetes for quite some time and was on a sulfonylurea again for quite some time. So number one, it, it probably isn't working that well anyway. One of my rules of thumb is when we start insulin, I always discontinue the sulfonylurea. It may not be absolutely necessary right at that very moment, but what I've seen a number of times is if it doesn't get discontinued at that point, it's very easy to forget about. And one of the concerns with the combination of insulin and sulfonylureas is that you see a, a greater incidence of very rare and unpredictable, and I guess not very rare, just unpredictable hypoglycemic events. And you see this a lot in elderly patients as well. So my rule of thumb is that when you start insulin, you should just discontinue the sulfonylurea just to be safe and make sure you don't put a patient at a kind of an unneeded risk of, of hypoglycemia. The other reason is that the American Diabetes Association has become a little bit more clear on where they think sulfonylureas fit in the treatment algorithm for diabetes. 
And you'll see here with the yellow kind of highlight that sulfonylureas along with the TZDs are at the very end of the treatment algorithm. And they're basically only considered appropriate when cost is the major factor. So essentially everything else should come before sulfonylureas unless a patient literally cannot afford anything else. Uh, and this is actually catching up with what the AACE has been saying for a couple years. And this is that they put sulfonylureas at the very bottom of their treatment algorithm for patients who need single therapy, dual therapy, triple therapy, with, without insulin. They've put these at the very bottom of their treatment algorithm and with a little kind of caution sign that says when you are using these, you should use these very cautiously. So this goes in line with what both the American Diabetes Association and the AACE are saying that really sulfonylureas are kind of falling out of favor. And again, the combination of sulfonylureas and insulin, particularly in an elderly patient, can be pretty dangerous. So moving on just very briefly, the last two cases we'll talk about will be pain and anxiolytics. And again, Corey Kennelty will be talking about these at length, but these occur frequently enough in our family medicine clinic and in our geriatric assessment clinic that I feel like it's worth talking about. So this is an 88-year-old gentleman who has spinal stenosis, osteoarthritis of the neck, hypothyroidism, hypertension, and a history of bladder cancer. So his med list is a little bit more impressive compared to some of the previous patients, but still not that 25 medication med list. If you saw this as a med list in your clinic with just the med list, you wouldn't look twice at it. However, one of the reasons that he would be considered for polypharmacy is he has uh, some dangerous medications, potentially dangerous medications on his list. So the ones that really should stick out to you are the opioids. So the hydrocodone, acetaminophen, and the controlled release morphine. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a history based on how we got to where we are with this patient right now. So he established care at UIHC in 2011 and essentially had been tried on every pain medication that was possible. So he'd been on tramadol, he'd been on gabapentin, nortriptyline, Celebrex, naproxen, he'd had epidural steroid in injections, and established care at UIHC in 2011. So basically at that time, he was on six hydrocodone acetaminophen 5 per 325 tablets a day. He was taking them literally every four hours. He was waking some, himself up in the middle of the night to take these medications. And frankly, he was perseverating over his pain management. So over the course of the year, we got to know him and realized that this was his primary concern and it was essentially running his life. So we decided that we would discontinue the hydrocodone and actually put him on a long acting opioid just to try to get him to not focus so much on his pain management. So we started with oxycodone, we kept the duloxetine and we kept the scheduled acetaminophen. Over again, the, the course of that following year, he gradually increased up to 20 milligrams of the oxycodone twice a day, kept everything else the same. In 2014, the insurance mandated that we switch from oxycodone to morphine. Um, not a real big deal, but just a different medication that he had to start getting. And then in light of the, the current opioid epidemic and the recommendations from the CDC, uh, in 2017, we added naloxone just as an as-needed thing because he was on a decent amount of morphine with the hydrocodone as needed. So again, this topic is, is pretty hot right now, and with the current culture of the opioid epidemic, the CDC makes it very clear that opioids absolutely should not be first line, and I think we all understand that. The problem with this that we just, we, we talk with our pharmacy students and residents and our medical students and residents is that unfortunately this is also probably, the pendulum might be swinging a little bit too far where there's the stigma that opioids are not good for anyone. And there's never a situation where we should have opioids. And frankly, that's not true either. We need to find a sweet spot in the middle of too many opioids and no opioids for anyone because just saying no opioids is not always the right move. Now what the CDC says is that we should be basically using opioids as an absolute last line. So we should be considering non-pharmacologic therapy and non-opioid therapy first. We should also only be considering opioid therapy if the patient's getting more benefits than we foresee risks for that patient. And we should periodically be assessing their function and making sure that they're actually getting a benefit other than just pain control. And then only continue the opioid therapy if ultimately the benefits will outweigh the risks. And again, this is a common theme of what we've been talking about through this entire talk. So I think the opioids kind of fit in very nicely with this, that we're, we're kind of doing this with all classes of medications anyway. So for this particular patient, the morphine allows him to frankly just sit comfortably in a chair. We've actually seen him off opioids and he was not even, even able to sit in the exam chair. 
Uh, it provides him adequate relief so he can lay flat in bed and fall asleep. And then a couple of his personal interests are dancing. So the facility in which he lives has a kind of a dance thing every Thursday night that is probably what he's living for currently. It's his favorite thing to do. Uh, he also likes woodworking occasionally. Unfortunately, opioids for him are causing constipation. He's on a bowel regimen. Uh, they've actually been worsening his cognition. So we've been following uh, kind of serial mochas with him and his cognition has been worsening over the course of uh, basically since we've known him until now. And that was actually what was able to allow us to bring up the conversation of, we really need to think about tapering off of this because we're concerned about your cognition. This is an extremely smart, extremely educated man who seeing the serial follow-up with the mochas understood that this was something that was in his best interest. Um, again, we have no concerns with him uh, taking more medication than what he's supposed to. But as we get older, we know that we don't metabolize things the same. So there is that risk of an unintentional overdose where the same dose that has been working for him for years may no longer be working for him. We know that opioids cause hyperalgesia. So they ramp up those pain receptors and things that previously weren't painful are now painful. Uh, and obviously opioids can contribute to falls. So when we're looking at the pros and cons for this gentleman, again, decreased pill burden. We'd be getting rid of two, possibly three pills for him per day. We'd be seeing decreased risk of falls, decreased risk of overdose, essentially no risk of overdose if we were able to get him off of it, and hopefully better cognition. Now this is not to say that we stop the opioids and his mocha necessarily goes back to where it was in 2011, but we would hope that we don't continue to see the trajectory that we were seeing for some time and obviously decreased risk of hyperalgesia. From a con side of things, we are always worried about worsening pain. And this guy has been off opioids in the past and he's been miserable. Because of that, we'd be concerned about worsening function. And for him particularly, uh, one of the times he was off it, he had such bad back pain that he actually fell. So we saw more falls off the opioids than we've seen on the opioids, which does not necessarily mean that he's not going to have falls in the future, but right now it's actually been somewhat protective of that. And this is one of the big things. So increased social isolation. When we've had him off opioids in the past, he's kind of just sat in his room uh, because he's been in so much pain, uh, wasn't going to the weekly dances, wasn't doing woodworking. So his quality of life actually got significantly worse. And then he was actually unable to sleep at all. He wasn't able to lay flat. He was laying in his recliner, not getting good sleep. So we had all these options. We could discuss the importance of tapering to a lowest effective dose consult physical therapy for an ongoing exercise regimen, refer for epidural injections again, titrate the duloxetine up as necessary, and then also consider tapering the morphine on a, mo a monthly and bi-monthly basis. So again, take just a second and think what you might do for this patient. And what we ended up doing is all of these things. So again, with him, we really utilized the worsening cognitive function as kind of our foot in the door to start talking about this with him. And again, he's a very educated man. He's up to date on the news. He knows that there's an issue with the opioid epidemic. But for a patient who's been on opioids for years, it tends to, the conversation tends to store, uh, turn towards that's happening to them and not necessarily to me. And it's, it's hard to redirect that conversation to patients to say that despite the fact that we trust you 100%, we don't think that you're gonna have any issues with intentional overdose. This is just something that's concerning because as you get older, you don't metabolize it the same and we're concerned of an unintentional overdose. So even getting him to pick up the naloxone prescription at the pharmacy was a major hurdle that he just did not want to be labeled as a drug addict. Uh, but this was something that we, we sat down and frankly had multiple long, long conversations with him and just told him of the importance of this and how strongly we felt that we did not want him to be unintentionally hurt by this. We sort of made a deal with him that, that included if he was gonna continue on opioids, then he needed to continue to see physical therapy very regularly. Unfortunately, cost can sometimes be a limiting factor for physical therapy. This gentleman has told us that cost is not an issue. He actually enjoys physical therapy. So we told him that as long as he continues doing that, is able to do that, uh, the opioids can be part of his pain regimen. We also referred him back for the epidural spinal injections just to make sure that we were getting the most non-opioid uh, modalities that we possibly could to help control his pain. Uh, the final thing that we told him is that much like the anticoagulation talk that we had with the patient previously, just because we're okay with you being on the, the opioids right now, 
does not necessarily mean that's going to be the right move for you moving forward. So this is something that we're constantly evaluating and this is something that's constantly moving and not something that just stays in one place. So the last topic that we'll talk about is anxiolytics. So we have a 78 year old gentleman who moved to Iowa City from Florida and has a past medical history significant for hypertension, chronic osteoarthritic pain, depression and insomnia. Again, in terms of sheer number of meds, not that impressive, but the triazolam should uh, raise an enormous red geriatric pharmacist flag that should raise an enormous flag for anyone. So again, his vitals look normal. Essentially all of his blood pressure, pulse, uh, labs all look fine. So the beer's criteria is very clear that opioids are not good. So I mentioned that oxybutynin is the poster child of the beer's criteria. Benzodiazepines trump that. Uh, they are consistently at the top of the list at medications that we should be avoiding and are potentially inappropriate medications in elderly patients. The reason for this is they, as we get older, uh, we have decreased metabolism of long-acting, specifically long-acting benzodiazepines, but all benzodiazepines and that all benzodiazepines increase the risk of cognitive impairment, delirium, falls, fractures, motor vehicle accidents, all of these things that we're trying to avoid in our geriatric population. One thing that you'll notice is that not all benzodiazepines are created equal. Although all of them can lead to those things, we get more concerned about certain ones over others. So if you think about just basically our mainstream stream benzodiazepines, we're thinking of alprazolam, clonazepam, diazepam, and lorazepam. You may or may not see some temazepam. So clonazepam and diazepam, frankly, are just way too, have way too long of a half-life for us to feel comfortable use, using these in geriatric patients. Just way, way too long of a half-life. While alprazolam and lorazepam have pretty similar pharmacokinetics, it's been shown that alprazolam has much more of a peak effect, uh, which leads to some of those potentials for abuse. And then alprazolam also has a little bit prolonged half-life in geriatric patients, whereas lorazepam does not. So if we feel comfortable with any of them, we tend to kind of lead, lean toward, towards lorazepam. Uh, one thing that's very clear is we don't feel comfortable with triazolam. Um, so we'll talk about what our plan was in, in the next coming slides with this patient, but uh, triazolam is not something we should ever consider, and it's actually been removed from the market in the UK for um, causing hallucinogenic effects and, and just overall not being a great medication. So for this patient, uh, much like the oxybutynin, it should be essentially a no-brainer that stopping the triazolam is a good thing. So aside from decreasing pill burden, we would be improving this guy's cognition, his balance, and despite what he thinks, we'd actually be improving his sleep quality. So although he feels like it helped him get to sleep better, it's very well known that benzodiazepines actually prevent patients from getting good REM sleep. So the benzodiazepines really are, are leading to poor sleep quality for people. However, this would obviously not be something that we would just stop. Benzodiazepine withdrawal is very dangerous, uh, can be fatal. Uh, unlike opioid uh, withdrawal, which is just unpleasant, benzodiazepine withdrawal is actually very, very dangerous. This patient had a worsening perception of sleep. He said he's tried off benzodiazepines before. He couldn't sleep for days. So there's certainly some cons in his mind. So we thought about discontinuing the triazolam, initiating lorazepam instead of the triazolam, uh, tapering off the lorazepam once we switch it, and then figuring out future options that we can use because we don't love the benzos in anyone. And then again, talking about proper sleep hygiene. I don't think we can stress enough the non-pharmacologic means and how these can help patients prevent polypharmacy and also help us when we're trying to deprescribe as well. So again, we did all of these things. Um, one thing, this is kind of interesting. So we, uh, this job was made a little bit easier for us due to the fact that not a single pharmacy in Iowa City had triazolam. Uh, so we had to taper him off of it. So we, uh, we told him that this was just, that there's a reason that none of these pharmacies carry triazolam. So we switched him to lorazepam, again, just feeling a little bit more comfortable with it, having a little bit better of a pharmacokinetic profile, but then setting the expectation up front that there's really no good reason for him to be on a benzodiazepine right now. So our plan was to taper him off of it, and we were going to do it slowly. Currently, he was not having any problems. Uh, he was not having any falls or anything like that, so we were not in a hurry. We told him we would work with him over 6 to 12 months to get him completely off the lorazepam. We've already initiated the melatonin, so already getting something to replace it, and we talked about having other pharmacologic options in the future. And then his sleep hygiene was terrible. So he, he had a TV in his room, his tablet was in his room, 
Uh, I mean, he did all of the stuff that you're not supposed to do, but unfortunately he had never really been told about that. So it's amazing how, how frequently you encounter patients who have never been told about some of the non-pharmacologic things and about how much of a difference they can make. So in summary, there's obviously clear benefits from deprescribing in older adults. However, each scenario of deprescribing presents a unique balance of trying to figure out the risks of stopping the medications versus the benefits of, of getting those patients off of those medications. I think it's of paramount importance that we discuss the goals with the patients and rationale for deprescribing uh, so they know what our reasoning is for wanting to get, the pa get them off the medication, but also make sure that we have their buy-in. So I think the patient who we talked about with anticoagulation was a great example that her goals were just slightly different than ours. And since her being on anti anticoagulation at the time was not imminently dangerous, we decided that it was reasonable to continue around that. It actually helped us make our decision. And while it's important to always be considering, deprescribing is not always the right thing to do at any given time. Number one, like we said, we have to make sure that we have the patient buy-in. But number two, we have to make sure that it doesn't put them at any kind of undue risk of adverse effects. So with that, I thank you for tuning in to, to this lecture series. I hope, uh, if nothing else, you at least are more cognizant of this process that you're going through when you're thinking about deprescribing for your patients and have this be kind of on the agenda specifically when you're seeing some of your geriatric patients. Thank you.